Welcome back to the Dirt Life Podcast. Uh, new year, new season. I took up, took a couple months off. Um, I have a guest here, Adam. Welcome to the podcast. Uh, you work with Northstar. We had, is Jacob your boss? Yep. We had Jacob on, I think, episode two. Welcome. We're just going to kind of shoot the shit. I do have a cheat sheet somewhere. Actually, I don't have it, so I'm just going to wing it. <laughs> um, yeah, so... Thanks for coming. You brought some more North Star beer. This episode is sponsored by North Star beer and, of course, Leica Geosystems, which actually is good because we could maybe start with some technology because I recently heard that you um, got promoted. So I worked my way up through North Star and uh, previous to the promotion was grading superintendent, uh, multiple crews. Uh, when I started, I think it was around four years ago, we had three crews. And we've really pushed for growth and development within the company. Uh, just gives guys more opportunity. So now we're at the end of last season, we're pushing six crews. The day to day, no different than any other superintendent, just making sure guys have what they need, whether it's equipment, uh, materials, uh, tools, all that fun stuff, doing the client relations, making sure things are ready ahead of the guys and then following them up and making sure the guys are doing a good job. Then uh, moving into this role, uh, now I'm the grading and technology construction manager and uh, that's a fancy name that's a fancy name but what do you do what do I do is I do very much what I used to do but at the same time I have a lot to, I have more divisional control and now it's more of what my vision is for that division as well as now our technology uh, because I think uh, around three or four years ago, we started moving into using GPS more and machine control and all the fun stuff that comes with that. So not saying I'm an expert by any means, mm -hmm. but... Well, uh, no one is. Dude. Oh, there's so much to learn. No one knows everything. Yeah, yeah. And it's evolving and changing so fast. I don't even know how you would keep up with the no. latest and greatest. Like, no, it's crazy. And like, I mean, you're asking guys to learn a completely new operating system language to them. It can be a lot when, when people throw it at you. Uh, but I do see the gaps on where we can use it and, you know, construction has not just been a job for me, it's a passion very similar to uh, Jake who you had on before. Um, it's something that kind of flows through our upper management where guys are passionate and after hours we're shooting the shit, sending videos, sending, oh, have you seen this piece of technology? Like. One thing that really gets me giddy as uh, like just as a construction person is when I see specialized equipment. Me too. I've always I that. love specialized equipment. When I see that kind of stuff, I'm like, okay, that's cool. You purpose built something or you adapted something to make it a very efficient at this one thing. And I mean, as far as equipment utilization, probably not great unless you got the job for that. But at the same time, it's pretty. It's really neat to see, uh, you know, kind of the backyard engineering and stuff that goes into some of this that makes those guys super effective on their jobs. One thing that you do have that I'm not a paver or do concrete, but I consider it specialized is the Gamaco yeah. sidewalk paver. Like, yeah, yeah, the curb you, extruder. Uh, you got different um, size plates built for it so it can... Yeah, form. so I mean, with the curb extruder, typically uh, uh, old school they worked off string lines right you go to a site you see all the pins and strings set and you trip over them run into them mm -hmm. all that fun shit and then you got various molds and various uh trimming heads that you're trimming the berm to the shape of the bottom of concrete essentially mm -hmm. right and then your mold is shaped to the top of concrete so uh you throw a different mold on there whether it's a mono walk curb mold uh our machine in particular we actually uh did an amazon project a few years ago and we it's a three leg and we change the orientation to that and we were pouring dolly pads with that as well 15 foot wide dolly pad and it's super cool to see that thing cruising down and when that thing stretched out real wide and you got two concrete trucks dumping right in front of it it's pouring over rebar and everything guys finishing behind it and oh man it's it, it's out of the world and so we've taken that and taken a step further and now we're using GPS with that. And that same job, we had, I think it was 120 or 140 islands to do. And in a parking lot, I mean, obviously you got your grade changes everywhere. Uh, the front of these islands were standard curbs, so it's draining into the curb, the mm -hmm. water. And then as you go around the back of the island, the water's draining out. 
this gamaco as it would actually go around the island. It would start at point A, doing a standard curve, work its way around the island. In the file, it would adjust itself so that as it goes around, now it's doing a reverse curve. It comes back, it touches back at point A, and we got to the point in that project where our guys were actually able to do the hand ties and everything with no forming. They would just take off and then pick up at the same point, a little bit of hand work with the finishers, banging out islands like you wouldn't believe. Now, do you have to estimate how much concrete you'll need for that? Like, uh, it's, I mean, I, I actually have the benefit that uh, through North Star as a foreman, they brought me into the office many years to estimate. Mm -hmm. um, so that's how I was able to pick up a lot of the info that I have on the back end of things. So it's no different than any typical estimation. Uh, you're, you're just taking your quantities and you know, you got to get your volume per meter of curb and you're doing the same estimates. Hopefully you're not over pouring or anything like that. Mm -hmm. I, ideally this is a lot more tight because you're trimming ahead of yourself. So the grade should be bang on. Going back to your division that you essentially run. Do you have freedom to run it kind of how you see fit? Yeah, I would I would say that's one of the things I really like. It's very about. important. Yes, yes. And one of the things I really like about North Star is our owner gives you just enough rope to hang yourself, so to speak, right? <laughs> um, you know, he lets you, he lets you do so much that you can be dangerous. And it's a great thing because it really lets you have a lot of creative freedom in how things should be run. Um, and, and I do, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I'm the one that can structure the crews. Um, I get all the feedback from the guys. Like it's, you know, by no means is this a one man show. I depend on my guys for a great product, right? We have the freedom that we can, this is the equipment I need. This is the manpower I need. These are the tools I need in order for us to be successful. This is what we get to put together. So a lot of freedom in that. And even, you know, outside of that, if we got a great structure that if we have an idea or something like that, if you can make a good business case for it, then it's likely that that will come to fruition. Why North Star? I assume you, you've worked there for a while. You must have chose specifically to stay there versus going to work somewhere else. I would say I've worked there for 10 years. Yeah. Uh, I, actually, I think I just got over my 10 year anniversary at North Star. Um, and I would say North Star, when I went there, it was, I was actually new to the city. And it, I didn't know North Star from any other company that was competition. Um, just happened to land at North Star. They were looking for the right guy at the right time. I applied, I got in foot in the door. Um, but I have stayed there for a long time. Uh, you know, like every job, it's not all gravy. There mm -hmm. hasn't, you know, you obviously go through some times where, you're thinking, why do I stick this out? But at the same time, though, you, you find that everywhere and you're going to get stress everywhere. Um, but it's the, the environment that they give you. And the fact that yesterday I went into my owner's office and I was like, Hey, I'm doing a project at home. Can I trace your uh, fender on your truck? And he's like, what the fuck are you doing? And I was like, no, no, don't worry about it. This is a little project. He's like, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Like, fuck. And I can go in again, spit an idea to him. Hey, have we thought about doing this? And it's just that little, the small company environment. But at the same time, we're still competing with anybody in the city, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you know, we're indemnified and all that stuff. So we're, we're working on the big projects. Um, but it's, it's still that, you get that small kind of company vibe. And that's, that's what I come from. I come from farm country and uh, that's how it is. You're able to make a handshake deal and that's what you stick to. And that's kind of the essence of what I see at North Star and would have, uh, would have enjoyed about it. And ultimately what's kept me around that and the opportunity too, because put your head down and work and uh, I've been presented a lot of opportunities. Um, I'd like to think I earned them because, uh, you know, I'm putting the effort in and uh, I showcase that I, I want to learn more and I want to grow. Uh, but it's the fact that those opportunities are presented and are available to me. I was going to ask you, um, what does it take to get promoted in construction? Hmm. I have my own answer because I'm similar to you. I just want your opinion. I would say that's uh, it's a loaded question. 
because <laughs> I, I think I think it really also depends on there's so many different sectors of construction in dirt construction yeah yeah but no i, I even mean like uh, as far as you got your pm team your estimate oh, yeah, yeah, team yeah. and your your ground guys your your ops right um speaking from the ops side of things which where that's where i came from that's where my heart is i would say it's like you got to show dedication you know uh i often relate to guys that uh we run small crews like our crew a typical crew is five guys for us so if you're not, if somebody calls in sick, one guy is 20% of your crew that you just lost. You put that in any other aspect, losing 20% of your workforce, that's a big hit. So guys that are dedicated, going to show up every day, reliable, and guys that show that they want to learn. The biggest thing that progressed me is I got on site, and the first, even before I hit a site, I was asking my superintendent, do you have a set of plans for the site I'm going to? I'd like to learn them and get to know the site. And he called me. He's like, I kept on bugging him, kept on bugging him. This is my first year at North Star. And uh, he called me. He said, you know what? You seem more eager than anybody else to get to work. So I'm going to call you in before I call guys back. Let's get to work. Mm -hmm. um, and then just that drive to actually want to know more and want to do more. You know, you got to have, I always say that you got to have the equal parts of content motherfuckers and ambitious motherfuckers in construction. You need guys that are always going to be your steadfast, reliable operators, foremans, every position. And then you need ambitious motherfuckers because you've got to grow. And you need to think about uh, who's going to replace you when I move up or when I retire type of thing. So you always need that consistency of both sectors of those guys. And I think uh, the, the ambitious and the the guys that want to learn, you just see they're thirsty and they're ready to go. Couldn't agree more. With your job that you're doing now, what is your biggest challenge? Is it people? Is it technology? Is it communication? I mean, it depends on the day. If the, the GPS is down, it's technology. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if guys aren't showing up, it's people. But uh, no, I'd say as a whole, um, well, and then equipment, like you've seen the equipment prices going through the roof. It's it's just nuts. But as a whole, I would say the people problem is probably the biggest right now. Uh, we're in a really good construction industry right now. Work is out there. It's available. Um, but it's finding the quality guys to put in place that's proven to be very difficult. Guys that ambitious motherfuckers that want to learn, right? Mm -hmm. So the issue is trying to find good people, but with the rate of retirement and like it's a challenge to get into construction, blah, blah, blah. We're all having the same problem of finding good guys. So like there has to be some type of other solution than finding the good guys. Like, is it finding people who are hungry and training them, making it easy to get into construction? Like what? I think you've touched on it in previous podcasts and it's I try to touch it on every podcast. Oh yeah, like it's 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 honestly man, like construction's a great industry. And you know, it's it's the meme that goes out of, oh my teacher said I wouldn't amount to anything and now I'm making twice their salary type of thing. That is no fucking joke. Mm -hmm. That that should actually happen mm -hmm. all the fucking time. And there's been this bad stigma towards the construction workers and this and that and it's it's something that sucks. Like I think uh, it's super unfortunate that you look at a lot of other skilled trades, and they actually have uh, an education system. They've got journeymen's, red seals. Well, they're considered a skilled trade. They're, they're considered a skilled trade, but yet the guys that are providing your infrastructure, that the whole community is built on, that you rely on every day, for some reason that's not a skilled trade. That boggles my mind. It's how we're not involved in, in the journeyman and the Red Seal programs. And even, I mean, you could probably attest to this, but to be honest, when I look at a resume and I see that they've gone through heavy equipment school. Nope, throw it out, next. Yeah, it's like, it's, buddy, it's a you joke. wasted 20, 30 Gs. Good yeah. for you. Yeah. There's, there's not like, you know, maybe if there was a different schooling system where it was an actual university or like college style program where, hey, 
you got to spend fucking one or two or three years at this. Or you're not passing. Exactly. And we're, we're actually going to fucking test you. We're not going to put you yeah. in a machine for 20 hours and then there's your cert. No, you're going you're gonna to specialize in something. We're going to teach you a little bit of everything so that you get to see what that is. And that's your general broad view. And then you're going to focus in on, hey, you know what? I really want to be a pipe layer. Or I want to go into underground. I want to be a mainline operator. That's where I'm going to share my focus. I want to be a, I just want to sling dirt. So I want to look at the dirt world and even learning how to estimate and all that stuff that goes into the back end. Like there's so much, in my opinion, there, there's a big hole there, a void that needs to be filled. And it's, it's, so you get like the garbage guys. And if you, if you can at least educate the people, then it makes, takes those guys that aren't that skilled or whatever, but here, here's a possible education for you. Here's a different avenue you can you can go down. Right. I just don't know what to do with the garbage guys. Like, we have to do something. There's only so many people. Yeah, yeah. And if they suck, we have to... I'm looking at a much larger picture and, like, way more than just myself. I'm trying to help the industry, so I'm trying to find solutions of some sort and asking opinions of various people like i don't know how else to go about this you know what i I think uh you're doing the right thing like this is the right thing right um and it's just it's making that effort to get the industry out there Mm -hmm. and step one is talk about it well exactly it's it's no different than you know the mental health health movement right Mm -hmm. you got to talk about it Yep. If if it's you know something you just push off or anything like that, like it's you got to bring awareness to it, awareness to the industry, awareness that it's it's not just guys playing in the fucking dirt and like you know guys that can't do math or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Like fuck, as a gradesman, my entire day is math. Mm-hmm. It, it's it's constant math of switching back from fucking metric to imperial, or you know, working on numbers, cuts, fills, whatever it might be. It's consistent math. So it's not like you can be an idiot and do this stuff. You have to be trained. There, There's a process to it. Um, but it's, it's that awareness that you're bringing that I think is huge. And it's we're, we're even hitting the ground and we're doing more job fairs now than we've ever done. And it's just even trying to get our name, the industry out there, like, hey, you know what? Yeah, yeah. You might want to go become a lawyer or your daughter or whatever, but um, that farm kid that's, he grew up born and raised on a farm, which I was too. It just makes joysticks second nature, right? Like that, that becomes easy for those guys. And the guys that have the good work ethic, the guys that, hey, I'm just going to put my head down and work. There's a lot of value in that. There's less farm kids. There's less, like, you're probably around my age. So I grew up in the 80s and 90s, like, shit was way different. Yeah. And we're running out of those people, so I don't know. Well, and it's it's training too, right? Like it is training. Yeah, you you got to be able. You have some, to make it easier for people to get in construction yeah. and to learn it and train it. And I think a lot of that is, uh, you know, we got to pay a lot of respect to the the old guys in the industry, right? The, mm-hmm. the guys that have been on the sticks or on the ground for fucking decades because it's it's not knowledge that you can just go pick up a book and learn there's that's not out there for us you got it in the seat right it's it's in the seat it's on the ground it's it's whatever it is and and let's be honest every company has a different preference or a different way of doing things mm-hmm. like i mean that's i think that's more, no more apparent than in dozer operators you talk to some guys you get like a 50 50 split you never back played or you always back played and if you can't get it level pushing forward you shouldn't be in a dozer <laughs> never back played right <laughs> and uh yeah so it's 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 a very uh interesting like you got you got to again pay respect to those guys those are the guys that knowledge is leaving the industry and actually you uh touched on it earlier that retirement rate Mm -hmm. i feel like that's not something that gets mentioned as much as it used to like 10 years ago baby boomers are retiring like there's a lot more workforce on its way out than on its way in and that's just increasing our wages that's increasing the demand 
those guys got to be replaced with somebody. The guys who make the machines are implementing technology to, I mean, make it really easy to operate with no experience. And the guys with experience are like, that takes the skill away. Yeah, I know, but like, you're not helping train people. Like, what else are we supposed to do? Yeah, I feel like that's that's one thing that, uh, you know, we kind of call it that old school mentality where guys don't want to share their knowledge because they're worried you're going to take their job. Mm -hmm. And for me personally, I want to share all my knowledge because I want to take my job. I want my exactly. I, I'm, after the, I'm, 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 yes. on, I'm on my way up. Right? Real so, lot like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Take my fucking job. I'll share. I'll tell you everything. Yeah. I'll train all you motherfuckers. Because then I, I want can... a day off too. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe a weekend off. That'd be fucking great. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's it's uh, you gotta pull the knowledge from those guys. But it's you know you just said technology is making it easier for guys to operate. I would say yes, but I. It also makes it difficult in a sense that I learned firsthand last year. We threw a guy in uh, a grader that's been on the ground, been in a skid steer, in a hoe. He's a fucking wicked operator. This is a guy I wish he would be a foreman. He knows how to run a mm -hmm. site. He knows everything about it. He's run a grader before, uh, old antler rack. That's what he was used to. And so we tossed him in a grader. We said, you know what, you you need to move up. Like, let's, let's get you in a grader. Let's pay you some more money. Um, so... Got the foreman, who is the best grader operator I've ever seen in my life. Like, just a fucking old guy. Every time you pass by him, those little joysticks are squeaking because he's making the finest of adjustments. Um, so he he's sitting in his truck, giving his two cents when he should. Um, and this guy, we threw him on GPS right away, on a GPS job. Sent him through a loop. And it was almost like a sensory overload, a little too much at the same time and uh so as the season progressed got done that job um and i could see the struggle and you know part of your job as a supervisor is to hey how do i manage this how do i navigate through the situation right mm -hmm. sent him to another job okay we're not going to use the gps on this job we have gps but we're not going to use a gps on this job and that guy after that project came out of it heads and tails better then he's focusing on just the controls, not what the monitor is telling him, mm -hmm. not what that info is telling him. He's looking ahead. He's looking where he's putting material. And it, it just, it, it boggled my mind how much of a difference it made. So I agree with you. Like once, I would say once you're an amateur operator, it can make you a moderate operator. Right. It's not going to make you the top level. Because uh, you still got to have the skills to do that. But it will take you from that bottom level to that mid-level. But you need to be that bottom level first. You need to learn the, that set of skills. Um, and I'm super proud where this guy's come. Like now we can toss him on a job and, and he kills it. And we put him back on GPS. And now he's he's not thinking about what that screen's saying. He's like, oh, this is where I need to move my material. Mm -hmm. Now I could just tell where I'm at. Yeah. Right? I get what you're saying. Uh <laughs> It can take a good guy and make them fucking spectacular, though. However, they need to be able to learn quickly how to use it with their old school style, with being able to see where the design is. The first time I ever ran a, a GPS dozer was like 2005. Trimble just came out a couple of years prior, and I was all, all already on a dozer, knew how to doze, all sorts of different shit. And um, I hopped in this dozer, and like that guy you explained, it was overload. I was like, okay, I'm I'm trying to move this dirt here, but I kept looking at the screen and it's like, I'm trying to dig because I'm trying to go to grade and like, I don't understand the concept of like, I don't need to get to grade right now, even though it's telling me. So it was like, he was fucking me up. Yeah. And it was like, my mind was just overloaded. So I get that, but in a very short time, I was able to, like, okay, I need to slow down a little bit here and only kind of use this as guidance. Don't use auto. 
just as guidance. So I'm doing what I think looks good because at that time I had a laser eye for grade because that's all I had was going off grade stakes. So I had to develop that eye for that. So I left that alone. I would simply glance up here the odd time to just check to see where I was and it was much easier that way. But it can make a good dozer operator fucking exceptional. You know what? I, I, I will... It bumps everybody up a skill. Level. Right, it you does. Know, yeah. If yeah. you're if you're no good at all, it's gonna make you half ass. And then if you're half ass, it might make you an uh, amateur. If you're an amateur, it might make you a moderate operator. If you're moderate, mm -hmm. it might make you an expert operator. Expert, fuck, you don't even need guys around you, right? Yeah. And and exactly what you said is is what I I press into my guys all the time. The GPS is first and foremost a tool mm -hmm. it's there to make your job easier but you cannot rely on it a hundred percent when it has to be right you can trust like technology to help you get the job done and grow your business with their cutting edge technology training employees is challenging and expensive but like simple to learn simple to use products allow you to get your workforce up to speed much faster Trust me when I say, like a machine control will help you move more dirt more efficiently. For more information on Leica Geosystem solutions, please visit leica-geosystems.com. I love the grading side of things. And, and I'm sure it's not like this at every company, but in our company in particular, um, being that we were smaller and now we're growing, growing, and, and we're becoming a bigger player in the game, uh, the grading guys were always the guys that were like, you know, tossed to the wolves of, hey, we got this obscure project that, uh, you know, we can't really tell you the process to do it, but we're going to toss you in there and you figure it out. Mm -hmm. And I've enjoyed that because it keeps things fresh, you know. If you could probably comment to it, but. I've never sat on the same job for three months in the same excavator every day or in the same thing every day, just pushing or just loading. That's never been my gig. We're a smaller company. We do smaller jobs. So we're bouncing around. We might get the same scenery for, I'm going to say average three, two to three weeks. And then we're on to a different job. Different. I, never, I don't think I've ever been in a job for three months. Okay. Maybe max three months. Yeah, yeah. Like the ring roads and shit. I mean, but. and, you know, maybe I'm kind of touching on, like, mining stuff. Yeah. You know, up north where it's, like, it's the factory work, essentially, yeah. of, of construction yeah. or of equipment operation. That's a good way to put it. Right. The factory work of construction. Yes, you're doing the same thing every day, all day. You know what you're doing tomorrow. I know what I did yesterday. But, like, the thing that I like in the city is, you know, you get that variety. You're changing the scenery. Yeah, you're doing the same thing in our case we're digging holes and we're filling them back in that's our job at a 10,000 foot view right mm -hmm. but uh, the scenery changes the challenges change the people change and it, it keeps things fresh and that's that's what I love you're always going to a different site different things just keeps it uh, you don't know what's coming at you in the next week which is fun with no bullshit what is your favorite part of your job like really like uh, Think about it for a sec. Yeah, yeah. Honestly, it, it's it's the equipment. Like, <laughs> so I grew up on a farm, mm -hmm. and I grew up on a dairy farm back in Ontario. As a kid, so you're good with your hands, or? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Actually, I that the funny thing is, like, I never my my dad would hate this because he's an animal lover. I was always drawn to the equipment. My sisters. They did the uh, they did the milking and everything. I would make sure that. Are the, they single or? Ah uh, no, I don't. <laughs> I'm I don't sorry. Want to go there, I'm but sorry. I'm joking. I'm, <laughs> well, don't punch me. I was gonna say you gotta travel to Ontario, but that'd be nothing for you, anyways. Uh, I'm taking Dory. Uh, um, no, they would always do uh, like the the milking, and I yeah. would do the chores. And when I was, my room was first John Deere green. And then when I got to choose the colors, it was Case IH Red and New Holland Blue. So I've always fucking loved the equipment. Mm -hmm. And that's what's always attracted me. And I never thought of what I do now as a viable option. Um, 
I went to college because, you know, my parents For said, what? Business, actually. Went for business management. And it's proving very beneficial right now. And I, I didn't foresee that. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was, uh, was kind of one of those things where they're like, you got to go for something. You got to do something. Um, you know, you either go get a job or you go to school. Um, but you got to pick something. Yeah. Uh, so I, I looked and Algonquin College was uh, in Ottawa. And uh, so I went for, it was small and medium enterprise management. So it was kind of entrepreneurial based. Um, but they teach you all the marketing, the management, accounting, everything that you would need to know to essentially run your own small business. I need to take that. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it's pretty slick. I, I kept some of the books because like there, there's actually some good content in there. And like even, uh, you know, now a lot of it has seeped through in my day to day. Like even the way that I write emails on a regular basis is because that's how I was taught to write emails in that course. Um, but it, it was, in my family, it was like, okay, go to school or get a job. Just figure something out. You know, I won't, I don't want you to be a bum, right? Mm -hmm. um, but now, like, where I am and actually looking at the equipment, like, fuck, going to Con Expo, geeking out like that, that's fucking cool, man. And I, every time, again, it comes back to, like, specialized equipment and stuff like that, I geek out on that stuff. It's, I just find it so fucking cool. Mm-hmm. What was your favorite thing at Con Expo? If I there's a lot of cool shit. There, no, I can like, answer that right now. Quadzilla, that yeah. that fucking track. That's badass. Zoom yeah. movement, yeah, yeah, all yeah. that. Like, there's a lot of cool shit there. Don't get me wrong. Like, like all the heads up displays and shit like that. But like, again, fucking love equipment and just as like throw tracks on it. <laughs> I mean, I will love anything with oh, tracks on it. Big bad fucking tracks like that. That thing was badass. It's huge. Oh yeah, yeah. Like I think 50,000 pounds that thing will lift. Like that's crazy. We don't have excavators that will do that shit. Right? Yeah, yeah, no, I know. Yeah, it's wild. So what's the future of construction technology in your eyes? Like in a realistic way, there's this bullshit with electric shit. I don't want to talk about that. That's what's no. played out. It ain't going to work. What is something that would make construction easier slash better and more effective in your opinion? It may not even be invented yet. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would... It's, it's a hard a, question. It's a tough one. That is a tough one. I mean, obviously the GPS is doing a, a good job of... Uh, the thing I like about the GPS is the accountability that it creates as well. You know, we're, we're a company that offers full service front to start, or sorry, start to finish. Uh, but at the same time, we're more than happy to follow another company. Um, and the GPS, when we go in there, we do a topo, they say that site's ready, well, we can tell you it's fucking not, mm -hmm. right? And that's always been a big point of contention with a lot of things because you go onto a site and it's like, our spec, as a grading crew goes, should be plus or minus 50 mil. Mm -hmm. um, and technically, you go onto a, a site where it's a commercial site, there should be berms cut in. Like, it it should look in dirt what it's essentially going to look like in the end. Mm -hmm. Not always the case. So I like that. But I, I think if you were to, to take that down to the next level and make that almost available to – everybody's got their phone all the time, right? And I think if you're able to walk around a site and you're not having to have a base station or anything, um, but you're able to get connectivity and you're able to say, okay, uh, here's where I am on site. This is what design should look like. And I've seen that aug augmented reality show. They do have that, yeah. It's pretty fucking cool. Like I even saw that they were doing that on a warehouse and, and uh, they're like, okay, well, if you look up here, this is where the beams are going to be and, mm -hmm. and shit. I think if we were to able blend that into uh, like, and, and trying to be uh, practical at the same time, like even into your phone, that you could hold your camera somewhere and you could say, okay, this is what the finishing is going to look like. Mm -hmm. But then also here's the information, like this is your, as far as a great guy, like this is your elevations yeah. and, and that kind of shit. That seems good in theory, but what what I don't know or what I want to know is how hard is it to 
I mean, build that model that could go on to a phone or receiver or tablet or something to show the augmented reality. Like, if it's extremely hard, a complex process to to do, does it need to be simplified? Like, I, I don't know how they achieve that. Yeah, for sure. Me either. I just... Like... What I do like about machine control is almost everything except dealing with the different file formats, with the different brands, and the base setup, and like... There's a lot to know. So it's complex. It is, yeah. In the end, when it's set up correctly, it makes your life and job very efficient and easy, but it's like all that other bullshit that is extremely hard, and like some people think you need to be a scientist to, <laughs> to do it. I mean... Sometimes I think you do. Sometimes you do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a lot of math, and you got to know a lot of stuff, right? Um, like I get some... Uh, I've hired some guys, and you get some surveyors spitting some shit to me, and like, don't get me wrong. Uh, like I said before, I'm not an expert. I know enough to be dangerous, yeah, yeah. but... These motherfuckers start spitting at me, and I'm, I'm like, I don't know what language you're speaking right now. I hear the odd English word. So what I'm trying to say is, I love the idea of the augmented reality. I think it's fucking badass, but, like, I've never used it. Is it hard to use? Is it hard to load? Like, how does no, it drive? Is it correct? Is it accurate? I think the benefit I see out of it, like, it's it would have to be tied in uh, with, like, your GPS. So mm -hmm. knowing, hey, this is where I'm at. This is where I need to be. Um but I think a lot of people work better when they can see what the end goal is. Absolutely. And that's something through my career that I've always tried to convey is like, you know, again, the information doesn't just belong to me. I want to tell you my plan. I want to tell no you. No one does that. No, and that, that's the worst thing is like, you know, in the morning, you're doing your toolbox anyways. You're talking about Ex the safety. Tell them why they're doing it. Exactly. You know, a lot of people work better if you tell them the why behind yeah. or the how behind the why or like explain it you know um i think i, I heard a, a a quote before that those who know why will always have those who know how working for them and i mean I'm, i hate to say it but that probably directly That's relates to quote. engineers or something yeah, yeah, but like yeah. it's the guys that know why you were doing that why you have to have simplest facts for me 300 mils of gravel versus 400 mils of gravel is because that's you, you need the bearing capacity. You mm -hmm. need to know that stuff. Yep. Um, but at the same time, like as a foreman or as a, as an operator, like if you just quickly convey your plan, hey, this is what I want to achieve, and this is how I think we should achieve it. And at the same time, I, I mentioned it before, we're all on the same team, right? Like it's it's a not a one man operation. Um, I want you to fucking kill it if you're working mm -hmm. for me because you make me look good. It makes your job easier. Well, fuck. If everybody's on the same page, and, and when I had a crew that, like, we were all experienced, it would be a quick five-minute chat in the in the morning, and then everybody's good for the day. And you just fucking go. Everybody knows what they're doing. You show up on site. Your grades been asked the right questions. What's my structure? This, that. And then everybody just sets shit up, does their thing, and they know what to do. And it just... In our industry, we spend so much time with these guys. We're with these guys. We're 12-hour shifts, five, six days a week. Mm -hmm. You spend more time with these guys than your family. So you better fucking enjoy what you do. Because otherwise, you're going to be a miserable fucking cunt. Mm -hmm. And that that just, like, carrying through your life, just dreading going to work every day, I can't imagine that. I've always enjoyed work. And sure, Good days and bad. Me too, except when I was on a rock truck. <laughs> Fucking want to shoot myself in the face. <laughs> I don't know how some people do it. Uh, you know, Not for me. I, I find the same. Rather be in a dozer. With a packer. If I if yeah. I sit in a packer, I... I don't know why they don't put radios in the fucking things nine times out of ten because I could fall asleep in that machine so quick. And I, I'm like... It is the world's most dangerous machine. Do you know that? Because really? Yes, because people fall asleep in it and go off of cliffs. I fucking... Or roll over in yeah, ditches, yeah, yeah, yeah. whatever. Fucking end up yeah. where they shouldn't be. No, I absolutely believe that because it's, uh, it's almost like you turn on that vibe, it just rocks you to sleep. But for some people, like, I I cannot do more than three rounds in a rock truck. I was like, I did this already. I drove this way. Don't want to do it again. I don't, 
I don't like that. My brother drove a rock truck for 10 years. Oh, shit. He didn't want to run, don't, didn't want to do nothing else. Just simple, easy fucking job. Content motherfucker. Right. Right? The world, we need all types of people. I just ain't that type. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, it's, I don't know what the fucking psychological shit, but you got your A-type people, your yeah. whatever. But, you know, you need, again, a fine mixture of everything. Uh, it's a recipe. Right, like, and it's fine if you only want to run a rock truck your entire life. That's cool. I mean, it's a good paying job. It's great. Yeah, and you do it for a long time. You'll be the lead rock truck, rock truck operator. You can teach people, and they'll follow you. And like, I mean, you know what? I, I I'm a believer that uh, no matter what you do, be the best you can at it. Yeah. You know, I don't care whether you're operating a packer, you're a rock truck driver, whatever you do, you should just be the best at it. Because at the end of the day, again, we're not just a one man team. Mm -hmm. Nothing gets built without those rock trucks. Yeah. You know? So like that piece of the puzzle is just as important as anything else. Absolutely. Just doesn't pay as good. That's all. That's not why I didn't want to do it though. Like I wanted I mean, I fucking wanted to do everything. I wanted to learn kind of it all, not only to to move up, but, like, my main reason was if it was raining, I don't want to get sent home. I want to run the dozer and do the whole roads and shit like that for the next day or, like, site prep, whatever it may be. Um, there's always work for a guy on a dozer. Yeah. Guys in a rock truck go home first and it starts raining or snowing or whatever, right? So, but... I mean, that's kind of how I began learning other machines, expanding my skill set so I could keep working because uh, at the time I was married and had kids and stuff like that. So the more I work, the better in a weather-dependent industry. Yeah. Um, but then it changed into, like, I like a challenge. And, like, I want to outwork motherfuckers, not to make them look bad, just, like, I want to be the best at what I do. And it became a challenge for me, and that turned into a hunger, and just I kept going more and harder and learning this machine and that machine. Next thing you know, no, I'm not the best. I'm not saying that I don't know everything, but like I can do a lot of different shit. It's pretty cool. It's you know jack of all trades, master of none type thing, but it's 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 really cool. I did dozer and hoe, so I'm not good on a grader. I'm not good on a back. <laughs> I fucking hate backhoe. Hate loaders. Hey, I think the only guys that are good on a grader are the guys that have spent fucking 20 yeah. years straight on a grader. Yeah. Those guys are fucking few and far between, let me tell you. I can blade a whole road with a 24, no problem. See, that's that's a fucking problem. <laughs> uh, shit, man, when when we're hiring, um, I, I get it. You can get in, you can operate a dozer in a mine, on a lease road, in those aspects. But they but, don't have grade stakes and shit there. But we're finishing within one cent yeah you know we got a fucking tolerance of a, a cent so yeah you can operate that but when you come to work with me and and not only that like take it to the work that we do we're not always in a fucking wide open warehouse we're not always on a subdivision mm -hmm. sometimes we're in fucking condo sites and uh you know i actually got to give credit and might be a fucking hot topic but i got to give some credit to city operators in the sense that those greater operators go into a back lane and they can make a back lane look pretty. And let me tell you. It's tight back. Right? Oh, fuck. Your blade's a meter and a half wider than a single <laughs> lane. So, like, it's, you know, for you to be able to do that and not have a skid steer follow you or anything like that, you actually got to have some skill. It should be a skilled trade. Comes back to it, right? Like, I don't know why it isn't sanctioned or whatever the fuck it needs to be, but, uh, again, it's it's crazy that, like, yeah, okay, if I'm going to live in a house, I need to have a, a licensed electrician, a journeyman carpenter, plumber, all that shit work on it, but my road in front of the house that's supplying all the utilities to my house, ah, that's fine. With... Those trades you just mentioned, I find in each house, everything is kind of similar. Where like, you run up this wall and it's this far away from these pipes and blah, blah, blah. There's like, 
things. There's specs. Specs that are the same that you can follow. In fucking dirt construction, you don't know what the fuck you're facing. <laughs> There's a manhole here. There's lines that could fucking blow up that you don't, not even located there. Like there's so many different challenges that aren't to spec. I mean, yeah. some should be, but. Well, I mean, I, but at the city, at the, sorry, at the same time, um, we're road builders. We got city of Calgary spec that we work off of, right? Mm -hmm. We can reference that for quite a bit of stuff. But I think like, what you're touching on is the unknowns. Like those guys are coming into new construction, ground up. Everything they're building, they're they're dealing with right there. Yeah. We're digging in fucking shit that we don't know whether it's never been touched before. Yeah, like the, who knows what was buried in the fucking fifties, right? Mm -hmm. And it, it's pretty fuck crazy. I love it though. Um, what do you hate about construction? What do you wish would change, or what needs to be changed in your opinion, or what is changing? Mm, that's also a tough one. I mean, I I think what we already touched on is the stigma around construction workers is something that bothers me because at the same time, uh, you can make more money being a, an operator than you can being a, a lawyer potentially or, or any of these high-profile, high-paying jobs mm -hmm. that you, well, these are the upper echelon of our of our cultures and uh i i hate that um me too but at the same time what i also hate about the same thing a little bit different is like you can make more but it takes twice as much time mm. yeah but does it if you factor in their education okay yes right yeah. like, and, and like the the yeah. dues they have to pay You're right, right? Like, yeah, like yeah yeah you factor in that education of they had to go to school for probably eight years Right, and then how then they far? Then start working. How far along were you at eight years into your career? Right, like you think where you can get after eight years of of fucking driving, pushing, being that motherfucker that wants more. You can do pretty fucking good at after dump. eight years. I was making seventeen bucks an hour. What were you doing wrong? I started at. Seven dollars an hour. Okay. Well, now you're aging yourself. I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> I started in like '97, so or '98, some shit like that. Yeah, it's. Uh, I don't know. I I, I see. I you'd have to fucking work out the math at the end of the day. Uh, but over a career, I would have to venture that they're pretty comparable. Mm -hmm. I yeah. mean. Not saying that you're a specialized surgeon or something. Sure, there's always yeah, going to be yeah. fucking... Yeah, whatever. they make bank. Yeah, yeah, exactly, right? Like, there's always going to be that caveat. But um, it's just that, you know, if you're the run-of-the-mill operator and you're the run-of-the-mill... Because, like, let's be honest, not all fucking people that do an eight-year degree are going to be specialized, are going to be well, super well-paid for what they do, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't guarantee you anything. It just gives you the education. You got now. I got the credentials. I still have to go out and fucking work to make a name for myself. Yeah, right. I have all these friends. I mean, they're younger and shit, but they all went to school for different degrees, and they can't even get a job doing what they went to school for. Now they owe all this debt. They should come to construction. I know. Right? So, working on solutions of trying to attract people into construction, it's like we need to attract people who work at Tim Hortons on make buck all come work construction. You can buy that nice fancy truck. You can get a house. You can provide all this for your family. You can go on vacations. You can do all the shit. You know what? I, and I was actually thinking that uh, earlier is we're <laughs> a society is kind of getting away from that stuff. Where like when you roll through Tim Hortons, are you giving them 20 bucks and expecting change? Or are you just tapping your card? Tap it. Exactly. They used to have to do the fucking math in their head to give you change. Yeah. I need to do math to do my job. Mm -hmm. So you actually used to get some form of skill out of those entry level jobs. Yeah. Where now, I mean, devil's advocate, technology has made it so dummy proof that like you're just a warm fucking body. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's it's 
It's taking all the skill. Like I used to, when I was in high school, I worked at a gas station. And it was, you know, interaction with people, talking to people. And it was it was actually a gas station where the employee would come out and pump the gas for you, mm -hmm. right? But I, at the same time... Yeah, do math because they paid cash. Like It's it's a little <laughs> shit like that that you don't think of. You don't, you don't think that, hey, this might have an impact on my life. But now, like when I go onto a construction site, if I'm, you know, when I'm checking grade or something like that, or I'm, I'm spitting out specs or, and we're talking about this is what the cuts fills are, my math is able to be so quick because... I think I can relate it back to that simplicity of I, I used to make fucking change for people, mm -hmm. right? But I just feel we need to attract people from other shitty industries that don't pay very what well. What are the shitty industries? Where, where are we stealing these people? You know, like right now, our, our operators can make more than a plumber. Our operators can make more than electricians. Why can't we so steal these guys from the skilled trades? We uh, we uh, we don't want to do that because then we don't build housing houses as directly much. Affects, yeah, yeah. That di that directly affects the economy. Yeah. Um, so we we don't want to take them. We want to take I don't know fucking bankers that aren't needed anymore because it's all fucking Digital. online. Yeah. Um, Tim Hortons people soon there'll be an AI machine that makes coffee for you and an arm that comes out it's and gives it to you. Way. Those people, a bunch of simple, stupid jobs that you don't really make a bunch of money doing, like quit that shit, come learn construction. I, I, I don't know how else to get people in into construction to fill the jobs that we need in North America, other than immigrants, which... So, I, I want to throw a question to you. What makes hiring an immigrant any different what gives them a different drive that we don't currently have well we're entitled here we have an easy life we didn't come from a second third world country we our values and work ethic has changed throughout decades and it's gone to complete shit where in other countries it's still quite strong and you don't really have a choice because you grew up poor we don't grow up poor here anymore we do, but in a different way. Yeah. I mean, poor for us is you can't eat out every... White people night. problems, I like yeah, to call yeah. it. First, yeah. yeah, first world problems. Our first sure. world problems, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, I, I, don't get me wrong. Like we, we, We've got people from all walks of the world, mm -hmm. and uh, I love talking to them, and I love hearing their stories, um, and, and you do see that quite a bit. Like I, find I worked it, with lots of them. I love them. Oh, it's, but man. But I don't know if that is... The solution. It's it's not a long term like it's a short term solution. I feel like, but it's not a long term solution because what are you doing? You're bringing those people in, and you're essentially washing them to your way of living, mm -hmm. so that okay, it might work for this generation, but next generation, that just went down the shitter. So, I worked with a bunch for about a decade, from Russia to Mexicans to all over the place. I love them. They can outwork us almost all day, every day. The issue is we don't have enough housing to bring people into the country. <laughs> this is a real topic. Oh, oh it very much is. And it's, it's, you know what, so it's a full circle thing. That's why I say we need to be very careful with the immigrants. Yeah, they can fill a bunch of positions, but if they have no place to live, like what the fuck do we do? So maybe we need to pull existing people from here from other industries i don't know i i don't think you're wrong by any means uh i laugh because you know what creating more housing is creating more jobs is creating bigger voids it's kind of like a fucking snake eating its own tail <laughs> type thing right you hear me so it, it's it's great for our industry fuck yeah i love it Build all the houses you want. I'm on board because that that just means we got more work to do. More subdivisions to build, more pipes to put in the ground. Exactly. Yeah, more... and like I, I do see, um, I know BC, I heard they, they're doing, they're incentivizing multifamily homes. More affordable, which, I mean, you look at uh, Vancouver costs, like that, that's a fucking different realm. Building culture is hard. We're here to do the heavy lifting. With over 30 years of experience in education, curriculum writing, 
and counseling across our team. We have created a program that helps you do the intentional work to create a better culture for our industry. Step by step, we will help you implement the four pillars, branding, team building, professional development, and community impact. I went to Amsterdam when I was in my early 20s and Amsterdam's by all means a first world country, right? Mm -hmm. But I walked out on the street, you're talking to people, they're so happy, they're just happy to be there. Like uh, one of the store owners shut down his store in the middle of the day to walk us three blocks to show us where we wanted to go. Like, super nice people. And uh, I actually asked the bartender at our hostel, I was like, I'm Canadian. I'm supposed to be the stereotypical nice guy. What makes you guys so much different? He's like, you're North American. He said, you want more. He said, one vehicle isn't enough. You want two. This house isn't enough. You want a bigger house. And I feel like we're setting that standard as North Americans. Where well, we're programmed to be like that honestly, from early age. But then, it, like, okay, this is what we want, but now that seeps into this is what we demand to have. If I'm building a house, it has to meet this spec, mm -hmm. right? Um, whereas you look where some of these are, guys are coming from, and they didn't have potentially running water or any of that shit. For them to just live in a, a fucking mobile home or a, a double wide trailer or a single wide trailer and have running water and heat and stuff, that's fucking luxury for them. We could build a lot more houses if they were basic, simple. Exactly. I see what we're getting at. Yeah. It's fucking brilliant. It, it's, it's, you know, and I, I'm sure you would get so much clap back though in the sense that uh, people are like, oh, well, I don't want to bring down the standard of living. It's, mm -hmm. it's no different than if you get a, a bougie neighborhood and then you you throw a trailer park or, or something, mm -hmm. or affordable living, buy it. They get pissed off. Well, oh, you're bringing down my house value. Well, they they are doing some cool stuff like prefab homes that go up in yeah. like a week or whatever. That's Even pretty cool. Renting homes and stuff. Yeah, I mean, they're simplified and stuff like that. So yeah, they're not fan, fancy, bougie. They don't, don't need a mansion. It's more clean anyway. Yeah. But... No, I think it's a it's a big issue, but if if we're not able to do something, um, adapt in some way, because you know uh, inevitably if you don't adapt, you will fail, and mm -hmm. that's I don't care whether it's business, life, or anything. Yeah, yeah. That, that that's fucking across the board, right? Um, so if we're not able to do something, you know, just as a as a nation as a whole, it's gonna it's really gonna stunt us and. A, going deeper down to the industry like we try to bring guys something super cool uh, and, and this is probably a lot uh, coming full circle to what you do is uh, our company's gotten super active in social media thanks and, to Jake yeah? yeah Jacob does a really good job in managing our social media uh, he's got our Instagram account TikTok Facebook um, and he's got some good traction on them too is he on Pornhub yet or uh, no, I think he's on like uh, Grinder. Yeah, yeah, that's the one. That's the one. But yeah, no, the the reach that you get is pretty substantial. Yeah. And as a, a manager that's hiring, I've noticed that. Super cool story. This Friday, uh, I got a guy coming up from Oregon that saw us on social media. He's like, hmm, I'm gonna follow these guys. Watches us for a bit. It's a pretty cool company. I like what they're doing. I like, you know, the culture they're providing, where they're at. Calls me up, and this was right for Christmas, and uh, yeah, dude, that this is what we're about, and, you know, just kind of shoot the shit with him, and he's a dirt nerd, so it's easy to fucking talk to him. Um, he said, well, I think my, my wife and I want to come up and visit. So they came up before Christmas, and uh, he's a greater operator. So comes up, I put him around a few sites, and like, this is what we've done, this is where we are, this is what we're going to do. Um, He's coming back this Friday, and he's interested in legitimately coming to work for us. And the power of social media—you oh. heard it here. Oh. Um, yeah, man, it's been an awesome chat. Uh, I'm I'm glad to see that you're succeeding at North Star. I love North Star, Jacob and uh, Steve. Yep, seems to be amazing. You guys are growing. Much success. Um, Thanks for sharing your opinions, and I mean, you you have a bunch of knowledge. We're very similar in a bunch of different ways, uh, the way that we worked our yeah. way up and stuff like that. So, 
It's a pleasure, man. No, thanks. I'm awesome. A, uh, absolute blast to be here. And uh, again, like we chatted, it's just could talk all day about just the industry and, and shooting the shit, right? You use Topcon, right? Yep. We we need to get you trying some Leica. Uh, mm. It's uh. Gotta give it a try. Yeah, it, it used it, to it, suck. Now it's amazing. You know what? Hey, I'm I'm not opposed to anything. I we will give it a shot. We uh, we've tried many brands, demoed many different pieces of equipment. Mm -hmm. Everybody's got their place, right? Yeah, like I I don't want to sell it to you. I just want to hear what you think about it. That is simply it. Yeah.